So my love of anatomy continues with uh, something in the carotid this time. So um, obviously it's going to be a broad brush strokes on carotid body tumors because it's not very common. So it's a group of paraganglionomas, which is a group of chromaffin cells seen most commonly in the adrenals. And then outside the adrenals, the most common side is the neck. Where, oh, sorry, is the belly and then comes to the neck. So in the neck, this is the most common type of head and neck paraganglioma. Uh, it comes from the adventitia of the posterior medial aspect of the carotid bifurcation. That's where the carotid body is. A little more about the paraganglion system. It's a neuroectoderm-derived chroma chromaffin cells. You'll never hear this again, but I have to mention this. It also, you know, hormonally active tumors secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, you all know that pheochromocytomas are notorious for this, and whenever we see a diagnosis of a pheo, then you know, all hell breaks loose with medical management, et cetera. But, Thankfully, in the carotid body, it's not that much. 90% of paraganglionomas are seen in the adrenals, 10% are extra adrenals. In the extra adrenal sites, 85% are in the abdomen, 12 in the thorax, and then 3% in the head and neck. Out of those 3%, the most common part are carotid body tumors. So what is the carotid body? So it's a little three to five millimeter diameter structure that's present at the carotid bifurcation. It has uh, two types of cells, it's chief cells and sustentacular cells. The chief cells are the ones that are the main bulk and the sustentacular cells are the ones that give support. Uh, this is again an image skimmed off of textbooks which I have no, no knowledge of what is what, but it seems like there is a little artery there that's on the adventitia. And this is actually not the carotid, this is actually some of the small periadventitial vessel. And this is the chief cells, and these are some, the black ones are the sustentacular cells that are holding this body in support. Uh, the carotid body is actually I mean, is supplied by a nerve called the Herring's nerve. It comes from the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, and uh, it is, the most important part is, it is supplied by the ascending pharyngeal artery, usually, which comes off from the external carotid artery. And this is important to know because perioper or preoperative embolization uh, if, if needed, it has to be targeted through the external carotid mostly, not the internal. Um, the carotid sinus is a baroreceptor. The carotid body is a chemoreceptor. It's mainly in change, uh, it's sensitive to changes in the pH and the CO2 and the O2 and partial pressures of O2 in the blood. It causes increase in respiratory rate, uh, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, tidal volume, and then cortical activity through the glossopharyngeal nerve. The epidemiology of carotid body tumors, the last red box is very important. Anyone wants to be an expert will take a long, long time to be one because most academic centers see very, very few cases per year. It's not a very common diagnosis to have. But what's important to know is the principles of how to attack one if you see one. 85% um, of them are sporadic. Um, some are familial. Some have hyperplastic changes. Some have neoplastic changes, but that's the key. The neoplasms are the one that you want to target. Um, they are bilateral in about 5 to 30 percent. They're malignant in about 2 to 50 percent. Broad range again. Uh, mean age of presentation is about 45 years. It's slightly more common in women than men. And the multicentricity of carotid body tumors can vary like 10 to 50 percent. Um, pathophysiology, chronic hypoxia is a theory. So if you're Felix Baumgartner, you have multiple jumps from outer space down there. Yes, you, he may have a carotid body tumor and may have it be scanned. Uh, but people living in high altitudes, COPD, chronic cyanotic heart disease, they are the ones who are at a slightly higher risk. And the reason is they have a defective Krebs cycle that causes increases of concentration of hypoxic mediators and VEGF that causes angiogenesis and that causes neoplasia in the carotid body. Okay. Krebs cycle? <laughs> Don't even go there. Yeah, so. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'm having a nightmare. Suddenly. No, no. I have daydreams too. Anyway. Yeah. So multiple pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. Yeah. You want me to include? I have it in the next time. Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> okay, so. so pheochromocytomas, paragangliomas are also seen in familial tumors like the von Hippel Lindau syndrome, men, uh, MEN2, A and 2B, neurofibromatosis type 1. And this is all important for the written boards, by the way. You will have a question somewhere, somehow. It's some little question, but if you know it, you know it. You don't know, you don't know. So yeah, yeah. not so, on the vascular boards. I, can no, I did assure actually. you. <laughs> Hopefully there won't not. Be so types. Yeah. <laughs> pathology is, you know, it's usually a, a soft, a firm to soft, fleshy tumor, which is seen at the carotid bifurcation. Um, sizes could vary. We actually, at when I was a fellow, we had a patient with bilateral six-centimeter carotid tum body tumors. 
we gave her a shiner block and a fishing pole. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, yeah. so typically they are not they are not incredibly big, so yeah. not very hard to tackle. The the pathology the histology is actually it's called a Zellballen, which in in German means a ball of cells. It's cell nests with ad adjacent cell tentacular or um, support cells. Um, there is uh, important part is there is. The classification that I'm going to come to in the next slide is about vascular invasion. We need to um, know in pathology, we need to know mitotic rate and necrosis rate, et cetera, as long-term prognosis. No one knows what, what it does long-term, but this is what we have to see for. Main thing is to look for neuroendocrine markers like serotonin or neuron-specific anulase. This is important because then you have to have a high index of suspicion of having paraganglionomas in the other parts of the body too. Uh, usually they present as an incidental finding. Um, sometimes a pulsatile neck mass, and uncommonly with the cranial nerve palsies. Not very common. Um, hypertension is also rare. This is, a, this is a very nice academic point of interest is, since the carotid body is sitting at the bifurcation, you can move it from side to side, but you cannot move, move it up and down, or craniocardially, which is also called the Fontaine sign. Diagnosis, please never inject, and put, I mean, put a needle into this thing, ever. And if you think about it, don't. The classic findings are always on MRI or CT or an ultrasound, where you see the classic splaying of the bifurcation with something in the middle. Uh, Preoperative urine, VMA, and metanephrines, et cetera, are important to know because you can have an underlying pheochromocytoma that needs to be addressed first, or it could, this could be a hormonally active carotid body, which also has to be treated medically. Imaging involves, you know, you can do all sorts of things. Uh, European studies actually have said they don't do any of the advanced imaging. They only depend on the ultrasound. Um, We've seen MRIs and CTAs, all of them showing the splaying of the carotid, and they say a salt and pepper. I don't see anything. I just see ribeye, which is medium rare out here. But um, <laughs> the salt and pepper means you see some parts of necrosis or some fluid fill, fill areas and cellular pattern in between. Um, oh, boy. This is not my edited slide, but typically I used to chop off whatever is not required. So the Shamblin classification. <laughs> okay, the, was described in 1971 where everyone pro probably knows this. The type 1 is where it sits between the two carotid arteries, the external and internal. And then type 2 is its sort of encasing halfway or maybe 3 fourths. And then type 3 is where it encases both carotid arteries. That's obviously where you start thinking about carotid uh, replacement and interposition when you try to treat these things. That was a board question, by the way, salmon classification mm -hmm. in the last couple of years. Uh, Preoperative evaluation and geography, uh, if you have a Shamblin 2 or 3 or a high, high, you know, or a long carotid body tumor, you want to get ENT involved, make sure the cords are okay, more so for a nasotracheal intubation, mandibular subluxation if you have to mobilize the carotid uh, intraop. Uh, Preoperative embolization is, uh, you know, is it worth the risk or not? We don't know yet. Uh, there are lots of, uh, lots of people who want to try, who don't want to try, but essentially, you know, embolization was introduced in 1983. This was described first for more for Shamblin 2 and 3 tumors to see if they can reduce the bleeding uh, intraop or reduce the size intraop. But um, usually this is a very highly vascularized tissue. Anything more than 3 centimeters typically has so many feeding vessels that preoperative embolization is very hard. So the, the threshold is actually smaller the tumor, better are the results for embolization. Uh, there are studies that show, the, the paper that came out of uh, Scottsdale said that, said that there are, there's a decreased blood loss. Um, embolization in a stroke was low. Um, some you know, patients required only one unit of PRBC. There was no mortality and very few neurologic injury. And then this study, uh, paper came out of Mayo Clinic in Rochester said they had a much larger sample size. Uh, the procedure was less extensive and ICA clamping time was sh I mean, shorter. Uh, the EBL was less, but there was no difference in the cranial nerve injury or no difference in the OR time. Um, so. It's mixed reviews about preoperative embolization. Again, this is a few slides to say that, you know, you have to target the external carotid here. The, there's a catheter in the external with the ascending pharyngeal branch, probably, and then you lead to a wonderful result, which is not commonly seen, though. Uh, treatment is surgical resection. There is no, um, there's no doubt that that is obviously the best so far that we know of, treatment for carotid body tumors. So it, unfortunately, we don't have a very clear natural history of how these tumors behave, because obviously, it's hard to keep it ignored and see what happens to the patient after a long time. Locally invasive behavior is also unknown, but could be seen, especially when you have like a Shamblin 3 tumor. Who knows what's the natural history of that ICA which is involved in that. Uh, radiotherapy is reserved only for poor surgical candidates or recurrent paragangliomas that are present in the neck. 
the carotid body tumor excision was first described in 1903. I'm sure that was quite some episode at that point. But um, the earliest reports were high mortality from hemorrhage. Like, go figure, right? So recommendations involved, they, at that time they said avoid Shamlin three tumors completely. Do not even touch them. Uh, but modern surgical imaging, current surgical, you know, and vascular techniques with preoperative embolization have had some success in reducing our fear of the uh, carotid body tumor. The key of the resection is, and they ask us in exams or uh, sometimes in, you know, uh, oral boards, that how would you attack this is, it's a craniochordal dissection. You start from the bifurcation and work your way up. It's in the periadventitial plane. That is the, that is the um, buzzword that everyone wants to hear, and that's what you have to stick to. It has to be in the periadventitial plane. You have to have in, in, in early control of the common carotid. Um, you, have, you may have to divide the rigastric muscles superiorly for more ICA exposure. You may have to ligate the occipital branch to the sternocleidomastoid because that can have a feeder in the carotid from behind. And uh, uh, shunting, actually I had one more slide. That's actually, uh, you have to be ready with carotid interposition. So you have to have some armamentarium. You have to have a vein ready. You have to have, you know, prosthetic ready if you have to. But a vein is typically what you want to replace the carotid with. Um, to orient yourself, this is how the patient is with um, the head here and the tail, I mean, sorry, the feet are out here. And that's anterior and that's posterior. So that's the carotid bifurcation that's internal, that's external being splayed by the carotid body. You can already, already see some dissection has been started there with, um, with some clips and the dissection goes on in this periadventitial plane. That's the ICA. That's the, you can see that, the ICA, that's the jugular, that's the ICA that's you know, has the best loop on it. And the dissection progresses very cautiously, actually you have to ligate a lot of small branches that come from the external carotid onto this um, tumor. And um, eventually, everyone is successful and the picture looks great. So that's, um, that's the end where you got the ICA and the, and the ECA and with the tumor completely excised. And then we wait for the pathologist. Yep. Very Thank nice. you. Thank you very much.